Welcome back to the Bucks Planet Podcast. And uh, let me tell you something. It's uh, not going very good over here. The Bucks haven't won a game in a month. And I understand. I understand by the correction police down there that you guys are always, where have you been? I understand I haven't made a, I haven't made a real video, right? Because the last podcast episode was not very good. I'll admit it was rushed. I didn't really have a lot of time to do it. I wasn't very efficient with my time that week, and I pretty much had to make an episode that week or I was going to be really behind. So, look, the execution of the last, like, month and a half from my end has been not good, kind of like the Bucks over the past month. But let's just get into that, okay? Because, quite frankly, I don't have time to defend myself while I'm not making podcast episodes, okay? So, because we're making one today, and let me tell you something. Uh, they might want to start winning, I don't know, soon, if they want to make the playoffs, if they want to have a decent seed. So let's talk about this, right? So first off, let's we're going to go back to the New Orleans Saints game. And well, let's let's talk about that one. So Jameis Winston goes down after he throws a touchdown and you know, okay, it was a cockerel that got beat on that one probably. And so the Bucks injure Jameis Winston right not intentionally, obviously. And then Devin White gets called for a horse collar penalty on that play. That wasn't actually a horse collar. And then here we go. Here we go with my first point, the officiating. Okay, well, I'm going to just get it out of the way. Okay, I'm not blaming the officiating. I'm not saying, oh, I'm just saying that it is a fact that the New Orleans Saints do not beat the Bucks without the officiating being that one-sided towards them. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not saying that they the Bucks deserved to win because they didn't deserve to win. I'm not saying that the Saints got bailed out because of the ref because they didn't get bailed out because of the refs. Because the ref, the Bucks just played horribly the entire time. But it is a fact that the refs helped them to win the game, and they would not have without them. It was a contributing factor, so I have to state it. So let's talk about that. So first of all, there's a, a horse collar on Devin White on the play. Jameis Winston's injured, which um, I don't know. They might want to check the rule book on that one because. First off, they don't even know what the rule is because first they're like, oh, it's only when you grab inside the 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 collar right here. And then so clearly he doesn't because he grabbed way over here. They're like, oh, well, now it's ni-. So then they, they they find this minuscule rule. They find this mini, minuscule part of the rule, I should say, of, oh, well, actually, if you just grab the nameplate area... It's a penalty, but then not all, But then, of course, there's one angle that looks like he's grabbing the nameplate. And then, if you go back and you know do actual research, which you know a lot of the refs don't do, a lot of the NFL doesn't do, he's not even really grabbing the nameplate. He's still he's grabbing more up here than he is on the actual name. So basically, the point is that they screwed up the call, and then they tried to find a really minor, minuscule part of the call that they said, oh, well, this technically could be correct, and we could save face with this, but then they were actually still wrong at that part because then you could actually look at a different angle that shows he actually wasn't fully grabbing the name, but whatever. So, next, let's talk about the next call that didn't make any sense, okay? And do you understand how pissed off this makes me? Because this is like three weeks later, and I'm still doing this. So, here we go. So, the next one. I, I'm, I'm, this order might be wrong. No, it's actually not wrong. So then we have a roughing the passer on Devin White, which we're going to get into that debacle of a football player in a second here. But we're let's get through this first. So the Saints run, I think, a screen. And so, you know, the quarterback snaps. He tries to get the ball out of his hands quickly. And Devin White doesn't even push him over. He just kind of just touches his shoulder, maybe maybe slightly touches the head, maybe like a little bit when he's trying to jump up and bat the pass down and barely touches his shoulder. And that's a 15-yard roughing the passer. 15. So, okay, okay. Well, I'm going to give you one of those a game because the officiating has been so historically bad this season that it's going to happen at least once. So, but of course, everyone were on offense. That's not how that works, obviously. So then, the, this is the inexcusable one, in my opinion. This is the one that I think that someone should have gotten fired over. So then, on a critical play, where Trevor Simeon drops back, and this is the same drive, the same drive. It was actually the next set of downs when this happened. Trevor Simeon throws a pick directly to Antoine Winfield, who, you know, kneels the ball, right, touchback. And then all of a sudden, a roughing the passer comes in, and let me ex- let's let's go back, and it's William Golston who gets the call, who doesn't even have his helmet on, 
and barely touches his back after the play that literally had no impact on the play whatsoever. So, and then you go back and watch the replay, and William Golston is getting mauled up and down the field, having his face mask grabbed and ripped off on a clear hands of the face penalty. And yet, he doesn't even have a helmet on. Our defense, let's, let's just, I, don't, I can't make this more clear. Our player does not have a helmet on, clearly indicating, even if you didn't even see the play, if he doesn't have that helmet on, that just automatically means it was hands to the face. Automatically, because how else would the helmet have gotten off? He didn't just take it off in the middle of the play. Doesn't make any sense. Does he want to get himself in? I don't think so. So automatically, that just clearly indicates hands to the face. And then he barely, without a helmet on, might I say, touches him in the back at, right after he throws the ball because he's too busy getting his face mauled off that he can't see that he threw the ball. And he barely taps his back in 15-yard penalty, negating the interception. Touchdown, Saints. Saints. I'm so sick of the narrative that, oh, the, the refs always screw the Saints. The refs always help the Saints. They didn't in one call. But I want you to go back and look at all of their calls. They always get the calls. Always. And there's, oh, the pass interference versus the Rams. Oh, I'm living in the past. Oh, losers. Losers like that entire city. And first of all, and second of all, they, they, get, they get every call. Every call. <sighs> So on top of the fact that it not only should have been a penalty on the Saints, it was a penalty on us for something that clearly indicates it should have been a penalty on them negating a turnover, which then allowed them to score. So obviously there was a lot of shenanigans going on in that department, if you if, if you will. But again, the, the refs were not the reason they lost. The reason they lost is because they played like crap. The Bucks played like crap. And let's go over that. So let's talk about... You know, Devin White here, who, let's just let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. He is not as good of a player this year as he thinks he is. He messes up zone. He can't cover anybody. With all that run stuff, all the tackle, where the hell has that been, Devin? And I understand. I understand. He has a good game against, you know, the Washington football team. Okay, cool. Like, I'm going to get into that. But up to this point, you know, it wasn't so good. And which by, we'll get into it. So... Devin White has had numerous penalties, numerous missed tackles, can't cover anybody, and at a critical moment, when the Saints have their last drive, he gets up and starts taunting Mark Ingram, and I know, I know, here we go, here we go, but Will, the taunting penalties are dumb, and and, look, I don't care. I don't care. Do you know why? Because they were taught. There has been clear enforcement, clear enforcement that you cannot look at the players and talk smack after plays, clearly talking down to them. You cannot do it. It's been called all over the league exactly the same. It's been exactly the same. You can say the rule sucks. You can say whatever. I don't care. I don't care what you think because this is my show and not yours. And here's the problem. He knew what the rule was. He knew how to avoid it. And yet he still did it. And then, if he couldn't just irritate me even more, he goes into the post game. And if you want to talk about lack of self awareness, listen to Devin White's post game against the Saints when they're like, So, why did you get a critical 15 yard taunting penalty, even though you knew how to avoid it? And the very, very pivotal point in the game to give the Saints a first down and put him in field goal range, his response was, Well, you, I play how I play. You know, that that's, you know, I, I don't want to get the penalty, but I play how I play. This is what I do. Well, how you play, Devin's not very good anymore because all you do is give up catches. All you do is miss all these tackles. You're giving up 15-yard taunting penalties to Mark Ingram. Who hasn't done anything in three years? Might want to figure it out. He does redeem himself in the Washington game. But I'm talking about the Saints game, so don't come at me yet. And then, after they kick the field goal, we think that we have a chance. We think that we're going to do something. Because it's a minute and like 46 seconds left. Brady's got the ball. All we needed was a field goal. We didn't need, you know, a touchdown or a bunch of, and a two-point conversion. on it. We didn't need those. We just needed a field goal. A minute 46 left, I believe. And... Uh, 
He just throws the game away. I mean, I don't understand Tom Brady. I mean, I thought this was like automatic. I almost considered getting up, maybe getting, you know, a soda, taking a nap. I mean, I was like, that's how confident I was. We were going to go back and kick a field goal. And little do I know, he stares. It was the most un-Brady-like play I've seen in a long time. He just stares down Godwin for maybe half a century and throws it right to... <sighs> Even though Mike Evans was wide open, but he never looked at him. <sighs> this is why this team... This, this, this is football, okay? It's like, oh, the Bucs have the best team, the Bucs have the best team. We don't have the best anything right now. Anything. It's hard, and I, it's the Gronk's hurt, AB's hurt, which, by the way, we can talk about the Tampa Bay Times debacle in a second, which I have been on, and my listeners know how long I've been on the Tampa Bay Times hate train, but we'll get into that later. Actually, I don't even have that in my notes. I need to actually add that to my notes. Well, 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 well. So, Tom Brady throws pick six on two-minute drill. Right, Mr. Clutch, pick six. <sighs> Look, he's the greatest two-minute drill quarterback of all time. Everybody knows that, but th this was not. This was not. This was not going to the highlight reel. That's for sure. It was a bad game. The Bucks played bad. We made a third-string quarterback. A third-string. I've been a backup. Third-string quarterback. We made him look like a Hall of Famer. Hall of Famer. <sighs> Which is typical Buck fashion. We've made Jay Cutler look like Hall of Famer. We've looked. I mean. Who was that guy, Paxton Lynch for the Broncos, who made look like the number one overall pick? Didn't do anything after he beat us. Case, Ke Case Keenum, if he played us every week his entire career, he might go down as better than Brady, and I'm not joking. It's been that bad. It's been that bad. It's a Bucks tradition to make these backup quarterbacks look like Hall of Famers and third stringers while we're at it, Trevor Simeon. Because then we go on to the Washington football team game, and, uh, yeah, we did the same thing. Taylor Heineke, backup quarterback. We made him look like a Hall of Famer in the playoffs. We're going to make him look like a Hall of Famer again. And before I move on, I want to say this, too. This, the, the reason why this is even more irritating than normal is, not because, is because of the fact that the Bucks aren't losing because they're not good, because we're getting out-coached, out-schemed, which I think we got a little bit out-coached in the Saints game, but... It's not because of the schematically what the other the other team's doing, whatever. It's the Bucks do things to shoot themselves in the foot, like commit eleven freaking penalties against the Saints. The only team truly to beat the Bucks this season, besides the Rams, is the Bucks. They just beat themselves. That's the only way this team loses, is they beat themselves. Over and over again. With the false starts, the offsides, you know, the taunting penalties, the dumb interception fumbles. That's how they do it. They no team, especially these mediocre teams like Saints, you know, the Washington team, you know, and then we got the Giants coming up. They can't beat us straight up normally. The only way they beat us is if we beat ourselves on top of the fact of them playing really good. That's the only way. And that's what we keep doing. And we have a bye week. We're all fired up. Woohoo! Bye week. We're going to fix our problems. We're going to, you know, last year we won every game after the bye week. We won the Super Bowl. It's happening again. We got the same team, same players. We didn't do a dang thing after the bye week. Not a single thing. I mean, I don't understand why, because I guess you had, we had half as many penalties. Congratulations. We had half as many. We had about 800. Now we only have 400. Just kidding. We went from 11 to 6. But guess what? All of 6 came at very critical points. So honestly, it didn't, it didn't really do anything. But speaking of, you know, if anything set the tone for this game, it's uh, Mr. Bigfoot, a.k.a. O.J. Howard. I haven't seen either of them. I mean, let me know when you see Bigfoot, and I'll probably let you know when I see O.J. Howard. Same thing. If anything sets the tone, it's on after a bye week. It's your first possession. It's the first snap of the game right after the kickoff. And it wasn't just a false start that O.J. Howard committed where, you know, you said me go, oh, false start, my bad. He was five yards downfield turning around looking for the ball, and then the ref blow, blows the whistle. 
That's how bad it was. It wasn't just a mental error. He just wasn't even on the same page. He wasn't even listening. Did he even look at the play? I don't know. Bad. And then that was it for him. That's the best part about Aaron. I mean, it's it's not just going to be a, you know, a, what, he's not just going to let you, get, you do that all game. He's going to get benched. And OJ did get benched, as he deservedly so. Deservedly so. He's like, it's like Rojo. It's like Rojo. OJ Howard and Ronald Jones. They were picked in the same draft or the same player. They just played two different positions. Tell me I'm wrong. You can't because I'm right. And I don't. Here's the other thing too. Everyone's gonna blame Brady and all these things. And honestly, look, the first. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. So then, after the OJ Howard debacle, false start. Right, we go three and out, punt the ball. They go down, kick a field goal. Okay, now we get a second possession. First snap of that, we throw to rookie Jalen Darden, who. You know, has been very more than questionable in the kick returning game, in my opinion. So we throw the ball to him, and lo and behold, he catches it, turns around, tackle, ball pops up, maybe a hundred feet in the air, and then about ten minutes later, it falls down right into their Washington players' hands for an interception, which to me looked like a fumble, but who cares? It's still a turnover. And then I can't remember if they scored or kicked another field goal. One of the two happened. And then we get the ball back. And wow, you know, we had a good drive. And then all of a sudden, Brady throws one of the worst passes I've ever seen before in my life. And it was just weird. And that was Brady's fault. That interception was horrible. One of the worst throws I've ever seen him make since he's been here. But a lot of people keep complaining that all he was doing was checking the ball down, which is true. That was pretty much all he was doing. And... To most of Leonard Fournette, who we know his catch percentage is never above 50%. It's 50% on a good day, to be quite frank with you. And to be honest, the reason why this was so irritating was because the scheme was bad. I think, the, I think honestly, if you said, why was the offense bad? Well, I'm not going to say it was because of Tom Brady. I'm not going to say it was because the rece- it was because of Leftwich. I think Leftwich had a horrible game plan, and by Leftwich I mean also Arians and the coaching staff, right? Besides all the de- defensive coaches, I think that they had a bad game plan. You, if you, I went back, I watched the All 22 film. Guys just weren't getting open, and when they were, it was kind of ri- it was like a 50-50. Open. It was like, is this really against the Washington football team defense? This is what we're doing. I mean, we've shredded all these defenses before. Yeah, it's Washington football teams are kryptonite defense. I don't understand. I thought the scheme was bad. There was not receivers getting open. There was zero adjustments made. Zero. Look at the tape. Zero adjustments made. Obviously, the rushing, <clears throat> the rushing attack was bad. But when isn't it bad? When isn't it bad? And honestly, the. The lack of play action, a lot of the maybe like non-conventional, I'm not saying trick plays, but like a little flash, a little something. We don't do any of that crap. I don't know why. We just don't do it. And especially the play action, the Bucks ran play action one time in the ball game. And guess what happened that one time? Touchdown, touchdown. Yep, didn't run that again. Said, oh, well, we don't want to run that again. We scored on that one. Don't want to do that one again. Doesn't make any sense. So the game plan, I, bl- I, blame, I blame Byron. Did Brady play bad? Yes. Yes, he did. The pick was his fault. First pick wasn't. Second pick was. He didn't play great, but he didn't play awful. He did not play awful. I think it was the game plan, personally. And it's very obvious that we need Antonio Brown and Gronk back. And by the way, Antonio Brown just got ruled out again today. And let's, let's talk about this for a second, too. So... You know, our buddies, our friends, you know, pals of the Bucks Planet Show, our main, you know, number one sponsor, uh, Tampa Bay Times. Let's talk about that debacle of a news company. So, first off, I've been on them since, when did I start this podcast? I was a junior in high school. So, four years, three, four years ago when I started this. And it's been way before this. I've been on the Bucks. I've been on Tampa Bay Times since I've literally been in seventh grade. Because... I used to get on them because it was every year the Bucks would go two and fourteen, one and fifteen, and then every year in the offseason they would hype us up to get more fans to buy tickets. And it was just complete lies. They had no idea what they're talking about. And what's my main issue with them? If you've been following the show, you kind of know this. 
My main issue with them is that they don't actually understand anything about anything in terms of football. A lot of these guys say that they're at practice. They say that all these things are happening, right? But And, and basically my point is that I, they just lie. Honestly, they just lie. They think that they're, they always act like they're at practice and yet they're never at practice. They say, oh, well, they, this guy looks great. He looks fantastic and all this. And it's like, you weren't even at practice. You, you weren't even there. Let me explain something to you. The people who are at practice are Pewter Report. This is why Pewter Report is the, is the best source for your Bucks news. And I, I'm like, I'm not even sponsored by them. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even sponsored by them. I have absolutely no affiliation with them. I'm just objectively saying that they are by far the best Bucks news source. By far. Now, none of this Tampa Bay Times crap. Pewter reports where it's at. Read their articles. Watch their podcast, too, on top of mine, of course. You need, don't forget about your boy here. But that they who are the people who actually know what's going on and actually are at practice, the Tampa Bay Times, a lot of times, they don't know what anything is going on. And so, am I surprised that... In case you're unaware, on, when was this, yesterday? It was either yesterday or the day before. It was Antonio Brown. I think it was Thursday. They said Antonio Brown was caught using a fake vaccination card. So he obtained a fake vaccine card so he could bypass protocols for the NFL. Which is obviously not good, if that's true. Which... Lo and behold, who reports it? Rick Stroud of the Tampa Bay Times and Tampa Bay Times. Tampa Bay Times is going to be all over because some chef that Antonio Brown fired is disgruntled and says, oh, he has a fake vaccine card and he's using it to blah, blah, blah. And then lo and behold, the Bucks go out, conduct their own research, find out that there's no evidence that this vaccine card's fake. They looked it up. There's medical records online. A lot of people think that, oh, well, if you just buy a fake vaccine card, you're all, you're all set. Uh, not really, because on the vaccine card, it says where you got the shot from. Like, I got it from CVS. So you could look up in the CVS system. It says that I got it. So guess what? The Bucks can easily do that. And then the NFL didn't really believe us. So then the NFL did it. They found it was that he actually got the vaccine too. And so it ends up being a story of nothing. But do you know what the point of it is? The point of it is that the Tampa Bay Times took a crap story full of lies and no credibility, and they ran with it because they're losers. And that's what they do because they're not good journalists. And I've been saying this for a long time. I'm not even really a journalist to be able to tell that they're not good. Look, here's the deal. You need to not be reading this. Look, the Tampa Bay Times does one thing good, and that's make cool headlines when our team wins the championship. That's about it. Because the rest of it, all the stuff in between the headline and the end of the paper is pure garbage, and I'm sick of it. And they completely slandered our team this week. Libel, right? I mean, you could sue for it, I think. And let me tell you something. I am honestly have had enough of the Tampa Bay Times and all their things that they say. I've, I've had enough. I've, I've had enough. And this is the... I mean, we for them to make a story... That is a distraction to our football team. So we now have to conduct research and figure it out. It's now drama. Antonio Brown, it's locker, it's, it might not be a huge deal, but it is a deal that could have been avoided if Tampa Bay Times weren't the worst news source of all time. And unfortunately, it is. And they, I, I'm just, I'm sick of them. Honestly, I am. And I hope they do get sued for libel. I don't care. Oh, well, well, you're a local podcast. You should, I don't support them. I don't support them. I don't care about them. They pretty much. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I'll stop. I'll say I got. I got. I got to stop myself sometimes, or you know, the correction police are going to come after me. Now, here we go. So back to the Washington game. So essentially, where I left off before I went on that tangent about the uh, Tampa Bay Times. <sighs> The Bucs don't have an Antonio Brown because he's injured and he's not playing in this game either, which is super annoying. They didn't have Gronkowski because we rushed him back in the Saints game, got injured on the first drive, but he should be back for the Giants game. Let's pray, right? I think Sean Murphy Bunning should be back too for the Giants game on Monday night. And let's talk about that. The offense misses them, which they shouldn't. They should be efficient without... We have so many star players that they should be efficient without a few of them. Right, they shouldn't need all of them to only be good, but hey, yeah, I guess that's the case. And Gronkowski, I truly, I remember at the time, 
I did not see Gronk's value when we traded, I think, a third-round pick to get him here because I was like, oh, OJ Howard's good, Cameron Brate's good, we already have two good tight ends. Yeah, we trade for Gronk. Let me tell you something. I don't think I've ever been more wrong in my life because he the gap between Gronk at this age and this stage of his career and OJ Howard and Cameron Bray is astronomical. It is an astronomical difference. And it shows that we really do need him. I mean, he Gronk back. Hopefully he's going to come back. But there was just a lot of things in this game that were weird. The scheme sucked. We already talked about it. And then... You know, we kick a field goal, or we scored a touchdown off of good play. Mike Evans, you know, they had, a, I think, a little bit of a coverage bust. Mike Evans beat his guy deep. Brady hit him for a 40-yard touchdown. Suck up, misses the extra point. And then, so we have to now go. There's 11 minutes left in this ball game. 10 minutes, 55 seconds to be exact. And all we have to do is we're down by four. All we have to do is get the ball back, score, and now we're winning by three. Okay? Or we could even let them kick a field goal and we come back and we still have plenty of time to go tie it, right? That's what we think. No, because lo and behold, we kick the ball off with 10 minutes and 55 seconds left and the offense could have essentially just gotten on the tarmac and flown home because that would have been the last time they saw the ball. Ridiculous. They had a 10 minutes and 30 second drive. Are you kidding how it was the longest drive of the season. It was 19 plays. And how many third downs can we give up? They were four for four on third downs that drive. And it was every single t- it was the same thing every time. First downs were up the middle for about four yards. Then on second down, it was either an incomplete pass or we would get a sack, or we they would run it and we'd make them lose yards. You're like, okay, third and medium, third and long, let's go, boys. One time and every time. It was a pass over the middle, and it was caught, and it worked every single time. And then it was all capped off by a score, and at that point, the game was over. Because the defense could not get off the field. Against the Washington football team offense, which is one of the worst offenses in the entire NFL, yet couldn't get off the field, allowed the longest drive of the whole season in terms of plays and time. Ridiculous. Offense could have flown home. And I will say this. I will say this, though. Devin White looked better. He had two sacks, made some tackles, but he was getting beat consistently by Rick, Ricky Seals-Jones, the tight end. Got shredded a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. But I will say he had a good game. He made splash plays. He finally got his first sack of the season in Week 9. And... He had two sacks, had a lot of tackles. He had a couple TFLs I saw. He didn't miss any egregious tackles. He got beat quite a few times by rookie Seals Jones. But look, he had a good game. And so I'll say he's looking better. I you, you, you guys, it might sound like I hate Devin White. Look, I love Devin White. He was, in fact, I told Alex and, or I told my friends, I said, look, Devin White's probably my favorite player on defense. I've said that. I've I've been open in saying that, but you know me. I I call it how I see it. And how I see it, Devin, is not very good this year. And it needs to get better. It was better last week. It needs to be like that the rest of the season. So that's pretty much all that debacle that just occurred. And the Bucks play the Giants on Monday Night Football. You know how we are in prime time. You know how we are in prime time. It's not good. It's not good. It's never been good. It's not good. Uh, am I nervous about it? Yes. I am extremely nervous about it because I think the Bucks could easily lose this game. And they shouldn't lose this game because the Giants are not a very good football team. Okay, the Giants are coming off a bye. They've had plenty of time to prepare. Hopefully, the Giants do what the Bucks did on their bye, which was nothing and come out and look just as bad and lose to a worse team. But they have to win. Gronk's going to come back, I think. Sean Murphy Bunning's 50-50. If he doesn't come back, we're in deep trouble. But look, the the Bucks are a better football team than the Giants. But will the Bucks shoot themselves in the foot over and over and over and over and over again? Will they do it? I don't know. I really don't know. Because if they do, then we're going to lose. And then we're going to be you know, horrible. So the Bucs are 6-3. and three. They have to win. This is a must-win 
game for the Bucks. Every week's a must-win game, but this one specifically because they look they haven't won a game in a month. So guys, until next time. Please, please, guys. We we need to win. We we need to win. We're so bad. It's been a while. We need to win. We need to beat the Giants. They're not very good, but we could easily lose the game if we overlook them. So guys, until then, go Bucks.